This week on Walking on Water, we go in search of even more conclusive evidence of the existence of the Western Interior Seaway, a great ocean gulf that dominated the center portion of North America 100 million years ago. After visiting some of the rarest rock formations in the world, we've gained insight into just how the Western Interior Seaway floor was created. We've learned just how violent its disappearance actually was and discovered that the evidence that is still in existence today is eroding away as we speak. Now, we hit the books in search of some of the largest and most fierce creatures ever to swim the oceans. Over 80 million years ago, just how dangerous were the shallow waters that covered the Great Plains? Along the way, we'll follow in the footsteps of some of the most well-known and famous American explorers in history to take a look at a creature that once inhabited the Western Interior Seaway. Then, we'll get up close and personal with some actual animal remains excavated from the ancient North American Inland Sea to get a better feel for just what these great and small animals were like. It's all part of our quest to discover modern evidence of one of the most unknown stories in North American natural history. What creatures inhabited this vast ocean and what, if anything, remains of them today? Join us now as we go walking on water. The Western Interior Seaway that covered Central North America 100 million years ago was home to a vast number of marine animals. Many of those animals are still with us today, such as sea turtles. But a large portion of the fish that swam the waters of the North American Inland Sea are now extinct today. Many of them were about the size of dolphins and fed on plankton. Others were very large and just a quick view of their jaws leads one to assume they were extremely ferocious as well. There were also the little guys of the sea. Millions upon billions of small animals not much larger than a human hand. It was truly a vast expanse and home to so many ocean dwelling creatures. Even after exploring the foundations of the Western Interior Seaway, its floor, we still need more evidence of its existence to fully understand its biological boundaries. What lived there, and how did those animals live? To find out, we'll be once again headed back to South Dakota. But this time, we will start our journey by following another team of explorers from the not-so-distant past. Well, they aren't so distant when compared to the Western Interior Seaway, which existed 100 million years ago. No, these guys didn't grow up too recently, but they did live in modern enough times that they were citizens of the United States. Their names were Lewis and Clark. That's right. Our great 100 million year old adventure picks up its first clue from an expedition that took place in the early 1800s. The expedition of Lewis and Clark, legally named the Corps of Discovery, was commissioned by President Thomas Jefferson in 1803. Their job was to explore the Louisiana Purchase to the north, establish trade with the natives of the region to the west, and make sure the United States laid claim to parts of the Pacific Northwest before any other nation. During their journey, they used the Missouri River to travel. Rivers were at the time like modern interstates. It was the fastest way to travel. Along the way, the expedition would send certain items back to President Jefferson. These items they gathered along their way were the first solid pictures of the Louisiana Purchase and the West. Before we go any further, we need to do a little bit of background research. Thomas Jefferson, who was President of the United States at the time of this commissioned expedition, was not just the father of the Declaration of Independence, third President of the United States, or celebrated statesman, philosopher, and writer. In fact, Jefferson was a bit of a paleontologist. He was involved in the excavations of skeletons of mammoths in his home state of Virginia. Unlike many men of his time, Jefferson did believe animals could and had gone extinct. But he believed animals such as the great mammoth could and were still thriving in western North America. 
Therefore, his interest in fossils was unheard of for the time in which he lived. If any fossilized remains were unearthed by the Lewis and Clark expedition, President Thomas Jefferson wanted them returned for study, a man truly ahead of his time. Jefferson would later display remains of a mastodon in his own home. But the really intriguing thing that will interest our search came on August 6, 1804, in the Pierre Shell, just a few miles from the Missouri River. I've now reached the Missouri River, and I'm in the region of the Pierre Shell in South Dakota. That Pierre Shell actually stretches from North Dakota all the way to New Mexico, which means it covers a vast portion of the North American continent. The Pierre Shell is typically around 700 feet thick and is a dark gray color and has a massive number of marine fossils dating back to the period of the Western Interior Sea, 80 million years ago. Those marine animals died over time, over millions of years. Their bodies decayed and fell to the bottom of the ocean floor, and over time were crushed with seashells and other organic materials and create what we know today as the Pierre Shell. It was near this spot on August 6, 1804, that Private Patrick Gass of the Corps of Discovery found the quote, petrified jawbone of a fish or some other animal in a cavern. The fossil was sent back, eventually finding its way to the American Philosophical Society, where it was misidentified. It was eventually known to be Asaurosophilus lanciformis. Pictured here is the jawbone discovered. Sarsophilus was a fish widespread through the world's oceans. Its unique feature is an odd bony projection from its lower jaw that has no teeth. With a long, almost torpedo-like body and sharp teeth, it's likely Sarsophilus was a meat eater. Many more fragments of this specimen have been found since the Lewis and Clark journey, but the most intact was found in Jordan. The largest found of these fish measured up to two meters in length, suggesting they would have preyed on small marine animals, including some sharks. Some paleontologists believe that this fish used its long lower jaw protrusion to ram and stun its prey. Its most comparable modern fish might be that of a barracuda, although there is likely no relation. Just over one month later, on September 10th, 1804, the expedition made yet another discovery of an odd fish. This one, however, was much larger. William Clark's description paints an amazing picture, luckily for us, since the remains were later lost. He recorded, quote, Below the island on the top of a ridge, we found a backbone with the most of the entire length laying connected for 45 feet. These bones are petrified some teeth and ribs also connected." End quote. Other members of the Corps of Discovery wrote down their account of this find as well. John Ordway wrote, quote, The rack of the bones of a very large fish. End quote. Joseph Whitehouse said he, quote, saw lying on the banks of the south side of the river the bones of a monstrous large fish the backbones of which measured 45 feet long." End quote. Though the bones that were sent back to Washington were unfortunately lost, we can speculate from the concurring descriptions that this was most likely a mosasaur. Some have suggested it could be a plesiosaur, but in all likelihood it was a mosasaur. Mosasaurs appeared during the last 20 million years of the Cretaceous period. They likely breathed air and were very well adapted to living in warm, shallow seas, ideal for the western interior seaway. The smallest mosasaur found to date is about 11 feet long, the longest 57 feet. That means the mosasaur found by the Lewis and Clark expedition was a large adult. Equipped with a double hinged jaw, mosasaurs were able to swallow prey whole much like that of a snake, although it grew to 50 feet in length. It was a terrifying animal in its day. Items recovered from Jordan show that mosasaurs were amazingly covered with diamond-shaped scales, again, much like that of snakes. 
Some studies show that Mosasaur scales were, however, non-reflective. Paleontologists today believe that Mosasaurs were lurking predators that were calm until their prey swam by. Then, with a stealth-like attack, they went in for the kill. So here are our first true animal remains from the Western Interior Seaway. Amazingly discovered on the first commissioned expedition by Americans through the Louisiana Purchase. But the evidence doesn't stop there. More is still around today. Even more animals that once lived in this North American inland sea. Just a little further to the west in South Dakota, our next piece of evidence of the Western Interior Seaway unfolds. Again, more solid evidence of the animals that once lived here. We made a stop at Ken's Minerals. For decades on end, miners in the Black Hills have been making everyday discoveries that prove a vast gulf once covered this land. At Ken's Minerals, I found a polished fossil of two ammonites and a nautiloid. These fossils were both found in the Dakotas. They come again from the Pierre Shale. Both of these creatures are fairly small, but some ammonites could reach up to two or three feet in width. The largest ever discovered is about eight feet tall, extremely oversized. These particular ammonites are just about three to four inches in diameter. Ammonites can be traced back 400 million years. They went extinct about 65.5 million years ago, about the same time as the dinosaurs, but we know they lived in oceans. Ammonites are a staple of the western interior seaway. These shelled creatures are related to modern colloids. We have solid evidence that mosasaurs actually fed on ammonites. All that is left of them today are their outer shells. There would have been a soft inner body that typically is not contained in the fossils we now find. We do have a good idea that they lived in the open ocean because they are found most of the time in rock layers that are not with bottom dwelling creatures. Recent studies have discovered that ammonites actually fed on plankton. It's theorized that they defended themselves by squirting an ink at their attacker. The other specimen found in this same rock is that of a nautiloid. A similar shelled mollusk, nautiloid had a rather elongated shell. It's very likely that since these three animals were all buried and fossilized at the same layer, they probably all died near the same time, perhaps even in the same year, some 65 to 90 million years ago. Since so many of these small animals turn up every week almost throughout the central United States, they themselves are plenty proof enough of the Western Interior Seaway. But records indicate even more fossilized remains of animals from this ocean gulf. One fossil that also turns up quite often is that of a giant shark called a megalodon. Like ammonites and nautiloids, megalodon teeth are such regular finds that you can actually buy them at rock shops for really next to nothing. These giant sharks were extremely abundant 28 million years ago, near the time that the Western Interior Seaway began to recede. This smaller shark tooth is that of a megalodon that was about 15 feet long, very small for such an animal. From modern studies, we are able to see that megalodons could reach up to or just over 70 feet in length, larger than a whale shark. Most scientists believe that megalodon is kin to the modern-day great white shark. After several discoveries of nearly intact jaw structures, paleontologists have been able to see the positioning of teeth inside the jaw of a megalodon shark. It's frightening to say the least. Due to its great size, it's probable that Megalodon was an active hunter of large whales. A 2008 study suggests that on average, a Megalodon's bite force would exceed that of 41,000 pounds. Now compare that to a great white, which carries a bite force of barely 4,000 pounds. And you all of a sudden find a fish that may have been the most terrifying animal ever to exist. 
We've put our research skills to the test and found five marine animals that we know lived in the Western Interior Seaway. Millions more are called Central North America home, but we've been able to get up close and personal with these few. Now that we've seen evidence of the foundations of the sea floor and discovered solid proof of the animals that once swam freely in these waters, we're still left with the question of what life was like here 100 million years ago. What signs of the sea are still left for us to find in modern geography? And just what did this North American ocean world really look like? Next week on the finale of Walking on Water, after finding evidence of the western interior sea floor and the animals that swam in its waters, just what did the western interior sea look like? And does modern geography still reflect its ancient past? We'll once again go exploring to discover the land in which this lost gulf presided and take a virtual tour of the 100 million year old seaway. That's next Monday at 7 Central, only on Fossil HD.